Well, well, Church in the Wild, the, the, the reason what kind of led me to this topic is, is I, I love the outdoors. I, I think a lot of us during COVID have gotten a little bit more outdoorsy. Would you guys agree with me on that? It's like all of a sudden everybody's avid hikers and <laughs> going to hit the trails, right? It's, it's, it's been so fun. But, but, but I love watching the shows on TV. You know those shows where there's like a 21-year-old girl, she's going on the backside of Alaska to hunt a grizzly bear, right? And you're thinking in your mind, like, why in the world? Like, what father? Like, there was one episode of, of this one show, the, the dad actually left her in the wild by herself. Like, honey, I gotta go home, and you're gonna be fine, I raised you well. Like, there's bears out here, bro. Like, she's good, she knows how to hold a weapon, she knows how to fire it, all good. But, but you, you kind of look at those moments, and you're like, man, is that... Is that, is that really safe? I mean, it, it seems so wild. It seems so unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen, right? There, there's, there's a danger, but yet a beauty of the outdoors. There's a sense of adventure. There's a sense of risk. There's this, the, this sense of opportunity. But it's also a little bit scary. It can be a little bit scary, especially if you're not familiar with the outdoors and you get outdoors and it's, it, it starts to get dark. Even if, man, this is so funny. I've been doing a, a, a lot of fishing, right, uh, over the last, the, the last several months. And, and I, I go, there's a shadow cliffs right by, right by my house. And there's these two little ponds in the back. And sometimes I'll go by myself just to be with the Lord, recalibrate. And you hear just stuff moving in the bushes. And, no, and, and still to this day, I mean, I'm pretty comfortable walking out there and all that stuff. But you, it starts to get a little bit dark and you hear a little rattling in the bushes. And you're just kind of like, man, I don't no, well, what's, what's in there, right? So it can be a little bit scary, but, but fast forward, this next year, I'm, I'm super excited because um, by the grace of God, I'm going to dive with great white sharks. Uh, so for my 40th birthday, some dear friends of ours, they bought me a trip to Guadalupe Islands to, sh to cage dive with some of the biggest, actually, I think the biggest sharks in the world, biggest great whites. And we're going at the time where, like, the big mamas come through, right? And, and, and some of you guys, even as I say that, you're like, you are crazy, like, what in the world would propel you to want to swim with sharks in the wild? Well, like, it's cool at the aquarium, you have this little glass in front of you, but, but in the cage, it's unpredictable. Like you guys saw that viral Facebook video where the, the, the shark actually got in the cage? That's where I'm going. I'm going to that spot. And he, he, he didn't get hurt. But to have a great white shark in your cage, it is a little bit scary, and it's, it's a little unpredictable. But, but I would encourage you, and, and I would bring... I would propose today that the times that we're living in right now are very predictable in regards to Scripture, but we still have these unpredictable moments that we never saw coming. It's kind of like you prepare for a marriage, and then you get married, right? And it's like, man, I, I thought all this like preparation, and then you get married, and you're in the real deal of it. Or you're, you prepare for a kid, and then all of a sudden you look back as you're driving away from the hospital, and there's a little human in the back. You're like, what do I do with this <laughs> Right? And, and so, so we, we prepare, but there's still unpredictable moments. It reminds me of Thomas Edison. There was a time where 10 buildings on his power plant caught on fire. He, he got a, 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 an alert at 5.30, I think it was a.m. on December 10th of 1914, that his power plant was on fire. And the thing was so hot, it was such an inferno that when the fire department came, they tried so hard, but they could not put it out. And it just started taking building after building. And the New York Times was there, and, and one of the reporters, they, they asked him, well, what are you going to do? And here Edison is 67 years old. And he says, well, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. As soon as the flames die down, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to watch it all. And then the next day, I'm going to rebuild. I'm going to start to rebuild. And I think when we hit um predictable seasons and we find ourselves in unpredictable moments where we find ourselves in, in uncertain times, weary times, trial and difficulty of long periods of time, it becomes very easy to do one of two things, to either retreat or rebuild. We either retreat because we're just like, I'm just exhausted, I can't deal with everything, or, or we rebuild. Now, it's kind of cool because, you know, looking back, I never saw 2020 looking like this. You? I mean, can you believe it's already June? And, and we've seen the, 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 the brutality of 2020. We've seen the beauty. God has done a lot of great things in the midst of 
all of the chaos, but, but there's still some uncertainty. We're not out of the thick yet. There's, there's still some, some unpredictability that I think we feel. And I think in these moments, it's easy to want to retreat rather than rebuild. You know, one of the things that Edison said is as he's watching the fire burn, he looks at his son, he says, son, go get your mom. Go get your mom and tell her to bring her friends because they're never going to see a fire like this ever in their lifetime. Like this is an incredible sight. Like, like his building is on fire and he's like, hey, go get your mom and friends as a spectacle. And his son was like, what are you? No, I'm not going to get mom. Like he said, man, you, she will never see anything like this ever again. And I don't know about you, but in, in 2020, I've never experienced anything like what we've been going through in my lifetime. Right? There, there's been a, a global pandemic uh, with COVID. We're still, there's still a lot of different variables that we're, we're facing with that. There's been racial uh, tension and the need for reform and reconciliation. There's been a global shaking. And not to mention, you know, all the other stuff that's happening in the, in the world and just some of the normal stuff that still happens in our lives, right? We still have marriages and kids and we're still trying to figure out the bills and finances and we see all these just normal things on top of everything else, man, it can get pretty challenging. And so, so I want you to lean in today because according to scripture, these are very predictable times. Now, what I'm about to say is, is not, uh, I'm not saying Jesus is coming back tomorrow because uh, nobody knows when Jesus is coming back, but I am saying we, we do need to understand the times that we are living in, that they're very predictable, even though they feel very uncertain sometimes, and, and we find ourselves in unpredictable moments, like we didn't see things playing out the way that they have, but in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said to his disciples when they were asking, what is the end times going to look like? Say this in Matthew 24, see this in Luke chapter 21, he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now, this is really interesting. I preached on this, um, I don't know, probably two months ago, if you've been tuning in online. For those of you guys who are online, shout in the chat right now. Say hello to somebody. We're so grateful you're tuning in. But it's so weird. Now, now like, the game has changed, right? Now it's like, shoot in the chat, say hello. Like, it's a lot of stuff going on. But, but I think it's so cool because nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This last week, I heard a message by Ron Carpenter, and I preached on this a couple months ago, but he brought something to my mind that I preached, but I never saw it this way. And this word nation is the word ethos. It's where we get the word ethnicity. I thought, wow, ethnicity will rise against ethnicity. And kingdom against kingdom. Now, the word kingdom is the word administration. So um, when you look at it in the original language, it really has this notion of the kingdom of God in opposition with the kingdom of the world, the prince or the power of the air, meaning the enemy. But, but kingdom also means administration. How many of you guys know there's some divide in some administrations right now? I, I mean, it's, just, it's been crazy. And there's been a lot of different kingdoms, both nationally, uh, both within our nation, uh, politically, that have been against Kingdom, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but in the last decade, we've had more earthquakes since we started recording earthquakes than ever before. In fact, Mexico just had a 7.3 the other day. Famines, famines. Uh, we support an organization called Children's Cup. Children's Cup is, uh, we, we were able to give them a, a Christmas this last year. We, we give to them on a regular basis. And I got a call over this last week that because of COVID, transportation and delivery, some of you guys have experienced that with like Amazon, it kind of got a little wacko for a little bit, like your packages weren't coming in time, everybody's overloaded, and people were like, are we coming to work, are we not coming to work, and, and so what, what that did is not just affect a lot of our convenience, but affected the globe and just global distribution of food, and so, so there, there's, you know, across the world right now, people are hungry. And they're not able to get the resources that they would normally receive. And then uh, there'll be earthquakes and famines and pestilence, disease in various places. And I think we have, our, have our, had our share with that. And then it says in fearful events. And, and this word is really interesting in the Greek. We're gonna, I'm going to teach you a little bit today. Um, but, but this phrase in the Greek, it means, it, it means a terror that brings terror. A terror that brings terror. And then great signs from the heaven. Then Jesus goes on to tell the disciples, he says, but before all this, they're going to seize you. They're going to persecute you. They're going to hand you over to synagogues. They're going to put you in prison. You'll be brought before kings and governors and on a, all on account of my name. And this will be 
your opportunity. Everybody say opportunity. Somebody put opportunity in the chat. This will be your opportunity to serve as witnesses. Now, now this ended up happening. We see the narrative of the disciples as we navigate through the book of Acts and we see them handed over to, to rulers and governors. And I, I think this is pretty consistent throughout the church that as persecution starts to hit, this is kind of the, the, the narrative across the globe right now. Persecution is, is a very real thing where people are being brought before governors, before, you know, kings, kingdoms, princes, princesses. They're, they're being brought before under trial, under great persecution. And, and it goes on, it goes on to say this, it goes on to say that, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. Make up your mind beforehand not to worry on how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Come on, somebody, how many of you guys are grateful for Jesus? How many of you guys are grateful for the Holy Spirit when you don't have the words to say? And the Spirit of God empowers you in such a way to speak. And I think what this points to is, is in the critical moments, in the critical hours, there's a need for great dependence because some of the stuff is just going to be way above our pay grade. And there's just this need for dependence upon the power and the presence of the Spirit of God in our lives. Every critical moment, every critical hour the church has been in, it's always required a dependency. A don't worry, just live dependent. Don't worry, just live dependent. It goes on to say, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you will be put to death. Come on, I know it's Sunday morning, but this is the Bible. This is the Bible, and I got good news for you, but we need to look at the reality of where we're at. And what life looks like sometimes, what the church has been through throughout history, and where, where the church is going, and, and what, what life is going to look like moving forward. But I thought this was really interesting, Jesus speaking of the end times. It speaks of great division. Great division. It's like one of the key signs. Parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and you will be even put to death. Division is a key sign of these last days. A kingdom divided amongst itself, the Bible says, cannot stand. A household divided amongst itself cannot stand. A church divided amongst itself cannot stand. A community divided amongst itself cannot stand. A nation divided amongst itself it cannot stand. So the enemy works so hard to bring such a divide. Such a divide. Goes on to say, but before all of this, I'm going to go back to a passage. We just read this, but let me read it again. Before all this, they will seize you, they will persecute you, they will hand you over to synagogues, they will put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors. And on account of my name, this will be your opportunity. This is what I want to lean in today. I, I want you to lean into today. This will be your opportunity to serve as witnesses. So when all this is going on, with all this craziness, the church is the voice that says there's an opportunity, listen, we have a mission, and it's the voice of a, 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 a cry in the wilderness that says there's a better way, that there's a love, that there's a grace, that there's a mercy, that there's a justice, that there's a truth, that, that there's life in his name, and his name is Jesus. That, that this has been accomplished by the cross, it's been confirmed by the resurrection and now should be seen in the life, in the love, in the unity of believers all across the world as we have this opportunity to serve as witnesses. Now, witnesses, witnesses just means to testify, to show evidence and proof of. So you and I have this, this beautiful opportunity where the world is seeing opposition. Jesus sees an invitation. Where there's all this chaos and all this confusion and all of this opposition, Jesus said, man, there's an invitation to serve and to be witnesses. <laughs> Notice how it wasn't like, this is an invitation to just Tell everybody what you think. Or to hit people over the head. He said, no, no, it's an opportunity 
to serve as witnesses. So the question is this. The question is, is will we seize the opportunity as a church? I can't speak for the rest of the world, but as a church, will we seize the opportunity? There's nothing worse than missing your moment. There's nothing worse than missing your opportunity. I I remember maybe some of you guys are reminded of a story that I told, um, I don't know, maybe last year. But there was a gentleman, I was going to pick up uh, one of my coaches. He's, he was like a, like he's, he's a coach to me, and he was coming in to, to hang out. And, and I remember as I was going to the airport, I wanted to get my Starbucks. So I stopped at a Starbucks on 98th in Oakland, and I got out. And at that time, I drank Frappuccinos. Now it's just black. It's just black coffee. I'm getting older. Let's keep it simple. Um, just black coffee. So I, I got my little Frappuccino, and I walked out, and there was a gentleman sitting outside. He was homeless. He was asking for money. And... In my mind, I'm like, I can't miss the flight. Like, I'm picking up my coach. <laughs> like, I don't want to be late for that, right? So in my mind, this is what I said. I said, it's okay. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to talk to this guy. I'm going to come back, get him some food, money, wh- whatever the deal is. And so, and plus that would make me look real spiritual, right? I'd pick up my coach and say, hey, I have to make a stop. There's a man in need of help, right? <laughs> so we pull into the parking lot, and guess what? He's gone. And, and I know the grace of God on my life. I know God doesn't need me. God could use somebody else. But, but that just weighed on me as, I, as I, I was too busy for the moment where this man needed a witness. He needed to be served. And I'll, I'll never forget walking away. It's like, oh, I missed my moment. Ladies and gentlemen, as a church, in this hour, we cannot miss our moment. We cannot miss our moment. And, and, and it, it goes on to say, it says this, that you, we're going to have an opportunity to serve as witnesses, but what it's going to take is, is patient endurance. It's going to take some patient endurance. And I want to break this down in the Greek. I'm going to take you again. Like I said, I'm going to teach you a little bit today, so just roll with me. But this word, it's, it's hepo mene. It, re, it, it, reme, it, it means to properly remain under endurance, steadfastness, especially as God enables the believer to remain, to endure under the challenges he allots in life. In other words, God does not call us to run. God calls us to remain. God doesn't call us to run from the tension. God calls us to remain in the tension. But it's only the Spirit of God and the power of God that will enable us to endure, to truly endure, and not just kind of get through burdensome, but to get through in the tension, under the tension, under the weight, with the sense of heart, with the sense and a heart to serve as a witness. It's a big difference. Tension is not bad. A lot of times when we feel it, though, we, we, we want to run from tension. We, just, we don't like tension, but some things thrive in tension. And I believe that the church is one of those things. So many times we're trying to get out of tension that we just can't get out of that God hasn't called us to get out of. So a guitar is a great example of this. Now, I can't play guitar uh, very well at all. You'll see that in just a moment. Um, But but the guitar is so pretty. Like when you hear the sound, right? Oh, you like that? See? Got a little bit. See, and I got three chords in me. That's it. I got, I got C, I got G, and I got D. And that's all you need. That's all you need for a guitar, right? There's another in the C, G, D. That's all you need. But, but the beautiful thing about the guitar is it thrives in tension. Because if you want the tone and the chord, you want everything to sound properly, first of all, you got to, to bring some tension to the strings. You, these little knobs right here, they, they bring tension. And then on, on, on a realistic note, I got three chords that I can only play for about three minutes because I can't stand the tension that needs to be pressed on the neck of the guitar to, to properly portray the sound. I, I can't do it for a long period of time because if you look at Rigo's hand, if you look at Pastor James's hand, there's calluses on their fingers because they've lived in the tension. And they continue to press and they can play for five hours straight. Like, no joke. Like, this is another in the fire. And we're enjoying it, and they're like, oh, gosh, right? 
just, just a long period of time. And, and I remember uh, James, Pastor James would always tell me, man, just, you just got to stick to it. You just got to keep putting tension. I'm like, man, it hurts. Because tension is not comfortable. But tension is required for the melody to be produced in such a way that you don't go, huh? And so, so tension is, is not a bad thing. God wants us to thrive in the tension, to, to see the tension as an opportunity to be his witness, to, to serve and to be a witness. He didn't say that it was going to be comfortable. But he's called us to live in that tension. But it's not only tension that he says. He says if, if you endure under, if you remain under, he said you will gain your souls. Now let me take you on another quick little teaching tangent. This word soul is the word psyche. But you know what it means? It means to breathe. It means to blow. Which is the root of the English word psyche where we get the word psychology. Or soul. It's a person's distinct identity. Unique personhood. Individual personality. And responds exactly to the Old Testament word fuego. Put that in the chat. That's how I pronounce it in the Greek. Fuego. Fire, right? Some of you got that. Some of you guys will get that later. <laughs> All my Spanish-speaking folks are like, yes and amen. <laughs> the soul is the direct aftermath of God breathing, blowing his gift of life into a person. See, when God breathes, God creates. It was with his spoken word that his breath was coming from his mouth. Out of nothing, God created everything. See, we have these masks on our face because it, it keeps, as we talk, right, it keeps the, the, the breath from coming out because our breath can affect some things, right? I know there's a lot of different, just get all the other stuff out of your head and just listen to me, right? It's true, like, like your saliva, like you can catch a virus from breath, like you can catch stuff, like your breath has an impact, but when God breathe, breathes, God creates, God empowers, and I love this, I love this aspect because it's, it's God breathing, it's God blowing on us that empowers us, that shapes us, that, that roots our identity in him in a time where everything is uncertain. Like we need the breath of God. Love in the book of Ezekiel 37, it says this, then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath in you and I'm going to make you live again. I will put flesh and muscle on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that we are living in such an hour where only the breath of God will do. Only the breath of God will do. We need God to create. We need God to breathe life. There's a lot of dry bones. There's a, 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 a lot of things that are happening. We need the breath of God. And I love this picture because God just doesn't take care of the outside. God takes care of the inside. When God breathes, there's a wholeness. There's a completion of what God accomplishes. And so I don't think it's a coincidence that right now, one of the biggest narratives of our day is the narrative of breath. Like the worst part of COVID-19 is if it gets into your lungs, you can't breathe. You, you have this, 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 this picture, this, this reality that Tesla changing up their entire, you know, assembly line to create ventilators. To help people breathe. You have George Floyd saying, I can't breathe. You have police officers walking off of the job in droves. There's no more wind. You, you, have, you have just division and dissension happening at massive levels. Social media, I love social media. Listen, I love online, I love social media. But man, it's tense right now. It's thick. And if there's any time for dependence to be like, Lord, what do I say? But I don't think, I don't think it's a, a surprise that the narrative right now is breath. People are, uh, uh, just, just as a result of some of the, the cataclysmic events of all of these things, there, there is a, a nation, there is a globe that's longing for breath. And God says, listen, I'm able to breathe. I'm 
able to breathe, but here we are as a church, and we are the opportunity. We have the opportunity to serve and to be a witness that the breath of God still works, that the breath of God still creates, that the breath of God can still change anything, that the breath of God can still create something out of nothing, that the breath of God is still what our soul requires to have a proper and a healthy identity understanding a rooting in the times that we're in. I think in, the, in these last days, there's going to be great trouble released on the earth, but there's going to be a great grace released on the church. Great opportunity to serve, to be witnesses of the breath of God in the earth. And so, so because here's, here's the trouble that I have, though, is, is that we won't respond like Jesus without embracing the life of Jesus first. Like, like, it sounds really pretty, like, we want to be, you know, witnesses, and we want to go. But then I look at some of the church right now, I'm like, are you even saved? Like, what is going on? And so we won't respond like Jesus without embracing the life of Jesus any more than an athlete would uh, invite somebody that hasn't embraced their lifestyle on the team. Uh, like, for example, you ever see somebody that, that tries to emulate an athlete without the disciplines, without embracing the life of the athlete? You can see it very quickly in their performance. Like, okay, got this. Haven't trained one ounce, but I don't need to. I got the, I got the wind of God, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the Lord's like, yeah, that's true, but that's out of context. I, like, we'll never be able to respond like Jesus in this hour. We'll never be able to be his witnesses if we first don't embrace the life of Jesus. Embrace Christ in all that he is. Not just say, hey, you know, some of Jesus' teachings I love, they're kind of cute, but I really embrace my life, and I just pull from his. That's not the life that God has called us to. Like, if we're going to be a church that thrives in the midst of the tension, if we're going to be a church that thrives in the wild, if we're going to be a church that in the midst of everything, there's a joy and there's a confidence and there's a security and there's a stability in our hearts and our lives because we know who we are, because God is breathing into our life. We're, we're, we're longing and we're, we're, we're drawing from the, the presence of God because there's a dependency upon him in, in our life that, that, that some spiritual disciplines revolve around to say, God, you're the priority. You are the priority. Because if not, this is the deal. Or let me just say it like this. We will not be able to fulfill the mission of Christ without first embracing the life of Christ. It's just another way to get it in our hearts and our minds that, that we're not going to want to fulfill the mission of Christ if we have not embraced his life. So let me just, let me, can I just speak candidly and freely with you online? Can I just speak with you? Yeah. Like, what are you most persuaded by right now? Like, is it, is it your politics? Is it your preferences? Is it your comforts? Is it, the, the, is it, is it opin, your opinion? Is it the media? Or is it the spirit of God? Like, like what are you most persuaded by right now? Because there's an opportunity to serve as witnesses as the nation is crying out for breath. But how do we do that? Jesus said in Matthew 28, he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Stop. I love that part. This is my favorite part. I love to go. Anybody else love to go? Like, let's just, that's so inspiring. Like, let's go and change the world. That's what God has called us to do. To go and change the world to move people closer to him and closer to others. Love that. That's my favorite part. But you got to embrace the entire commission. Because the next part's not so fun. And teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Like, come on, anytime you hear teaching, obey, and command. Uh, I'm just, I don't, I don't know. I'm so glad my wife loves that. Um, but it, it's, it's just like, that just doesn't, like, preach as good as, let's go! But it's a teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely, he says, I'm with you always on this mission. Like, you could be confident and sure of this, that I'll be with you even to the end of the age. 
But see, remember, Jesus is talking to disciples. He's talking to ones that have left everything to follow him. They've left their life to embrace his life. Like, like he's, talking to one, he, he's talking to ones that have truly found life in Christ, where the cross was a reality, the re- resurrection was a reality. They walked with him. They encouraged. They were encouraged by him. They were corrected by him. They listened to him. They abided in him. They made their home in his word. And then Jesus said, as he gave them the Great Commission, he said, go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Like they're walking this out. Only disciples can make disciples. Only disciples can make disciples. Can I just tell you, if you are not following Jesus for real, the Great Commission will feel like a burden rather than a mission. Ah. Uh. Got to be a witness. I got to serve people. But if you see the, if you, if you get a glimpse every day of the way God has served you, sign me up. The gospel before you as the lens that you filter everything through. I'm telling you, the mission won't be a burden. The mission, it'll be a mission. But you're not going to want, listen, if you haven't left everything to follow him, you think you're going to want to leave everything for it to accomplish his purpose? Oh, no way. And so, so what, is, what does that even, even look like? Well, let me give you an example of, of what I think we need to, to lean into as a church. You know, the Olympics are canceled this year. Anybody hear that? It's not a surprise, right? We, Olympics are, are canceled. But what's interesting about the Olympics is every time the Olympics happen, they go into a particular region, and then they build all of this stuff to get through the Olympics. They build buildings and pools and parks. They build all the stuff in order to get through the Olympics. And then after the Olympics is done, they have no plan for all the stuff. It's just like, wow, that was amazing. We got like 20 pools. What do we do with them? We got parks that nobody goes to. They're in the middle of the city, right? We've got buildings that aren't being used or occupied. I think the temptation, one of the ways that we can retreat is just simply build to get us through. Like, we just don't want to get, we don't want to really be in the tension. We're just got to kind of get us through. We just got to build something, a construct, just to get us through. But I would propose another idea. What if we, instead of building things to get us through, we become everything God has called us to be? Like, what if in this season we just didn't build stuff to get us through, but we become everything that God has called us to be? Because that will take us beyond this season. That will take not only us, but others, as we see the beautiful reality and opportunity to serve and be witnesses are you guys are you guys tracking with me to leave everything what if we left everything like for real to follow him like what would life really look like you see this passage in in luke chapter 18 there's a story of the rich young ruler and this guy had everything right young dude had his money set it was good but he, but he felt this lack in his life, and he comes to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, what do I need to gain eternal life? Like, I feel this lack, and Jesus said, you know, playing into the conversation, he said, uh, you know, uh, obey the commands. He said, man, I've done, all of, I've done all of it, Jesus. That was a pretty bold statement, right? I, I fulfilled all of them. Give me something else. He says, yeah, but there's one thing. Sell everything you have. And give it to the poor. See, your get, listen, everybody lean in on this. You leaving everything may just look like you leaving one thing. Because maybe there's a lot of things that, man, you're like, yeah, I follow Jesus. But there's one thing in your life that's been separating you from God. That's been getting in between you and God. And, and he walked away. He said, Jesus, sorry, I can't do that. I can't give away all my stuff. Like, like my identity, my stuff. Like, everything is... It, like, I need this stuff. He walked away from the breath of life. The worst business decision in his life. And then you have Peter in Luke chapter 5. It's, it's a little bit of a reversal. All of a sudden, Peter's out fishing one day. And Jesus says, hey, why don't you throw your nets on the other side of the boat? And they catch the biggest catch of Peter's life. I mean, they just keep coming up. They gotta, they're just like, man, what in the world is happening? Man, get some more boats. We got a huge catch. 
And Peter walks away from the biggest catch of his life to follow Jesus. It says he, he left everything to follow him. The biggest catch! But he got the best deal. Because when, when Peter and the disciples, after the crucifixion, the crucifixion was unexpected for them. Jesus told them over and over and over, I'm going to be crucified, delivered into the hands of sinful men, and they're going to, put, they're, they're, they're going to kill me. But the disciples are like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then it happens. And they're like, this is for real. And then they go into a self-induced shelter in place. They're afraid. And then Jesus shows up after he raises from the dead. And look what Peter gets. After he said this, he showed them the, his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They were stuck in a room with no breath. Fear consuming. Unexpected circumstances. I love Jesus said, peace be with you. All of a sudden you could imagine when they saw him, it says they were overjoyed. Like, oh. Some of us haven't seen Jesus for a while. And it's time, it's time that we fix our gaze upon the only one that can breathe true life in us. I don't think it's by coincidence. The times or the season that we're living in, the Bible talks about this stuff. It's unpredictable for us. We never saw God coming. We never saw things happening like this. And, but can I just tell you, there's wind. You know, there's a place called the doldrums where the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere collide. It's called the intertropical ver- convergence zone. And in this zone, there's no wind. So back in the day, ships would sail into this thing, and because there's no breath... They would, they would die. They couldn't get out. Now with motorboats, it's a little bit easier because you got some power. There, there's there's some, some juice to get you through where there's times where there's no breath. Can I just encourage you, church, that if we're going to lead everybody to him, we have to first leave everything for him we're really going to be the church that God has called us to be. Like, that's just it. I wish I could call you to something less than, but that would be robbing you. Because what Jesus has for you is the best deal when it comes to life. Like the rich young ruler walked away sad, though he was wealthy. And Peter walked away empowered with such a joy that when faced with the greatest persecution, he said, I don't even care. Turn me upside down as you crucify me. Because I'm not even worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Turn me upside down. I found life, and it goes beyond this life. It's found only in Jesus. So make a decision today. I encourage you. Make a decision today to follow him so we can learn and obey and trust his commands. And the Bible says this. Listen, oh, when you fall in love with God, his commands won't feel like a burden. They'll feel like a delight because you have the light of life and wind and breath from heaven. Let me pray with you.